Okay, I think any parent who's ever gone on a Christmas road trip with younger kids has heard this. I'm bored. I'm a little yet. <laughs> oh, to which many diplomatic parents have answered truthfully, but maybe really not all that helpfully. We're getting closer. <gasps> Who knows? Maybe you're in the car right now, headed to Grandma's house for Christmas. While it's true that kids can sometimes be impatient, let's be honest, adults can be too. I mean, we're just better at disguising our impatience. So here are some questions I want to ask. Christmas is almost here. Like the song says, Mom and Dad can hardly wait for school to start again. But as we approach Christmas, what are we waiting for? Are we more excited about the trappings of Christmas while the substance is ho-hum? Well, I do believe there is a right way to look forward to Christmas, but I think it needs to have less to do with presents and food and family, as good as those things are, and more about the one it's all about. Welcome to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm your host, Dana Gresh. In a moment, we're going to hear from Nancy DeMoss Volgamuth, who has more to say about that sense of expectation and longing related to the coming of Christ. But first, I want to acknowledge that sometimes our expectation for Jesus is eclipsed this time of year by pain. A loved one who's missing for the first time, or tense, but it still hurts. A prodigal child who makes the family dinner difficult, or even political differences that come up when we get together. Lots of things have lots of people feeling hard stuff this weekend. Well, my friend Janet Milan is here to help us put things in perspective. Janet originally shared what you're about to hear on the MomCast for True Girl. That's a podcast for moms of 7- to 12-year-old girls that Janet, Shani McKenzie, and I host together. And I thought what Janet shared about Christmas emotions on this month's True Girl MomCast was so good that I wanted you to hear it. All right, picture this. It's Christmas Eve, and a woman is home getting ready to go out for Christmas Eve festivities with her family. All of a sudden, she flops onto the couch in her living room, and she starts to sob. She tells her husband she just can't do it. She just can't do Christmas Eve this year. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's sad. It's a sad picture, right? Sad sad. face. Insert sad face here. Mm -hmm. Well, that woman was me. I was in a season of waiting to be matched with our daughter in China, and Christmas just marked one more year without her. One more year of noticing the emptiness. And guys, Christmas can do that for a lot of people, including our daughters. Like these holidays can be markers of either times of waiting or times of Mm. remembering that you're alone or times of a loss. They can really, we can kind of push things off and then a holiday comes and suddenly you're faced with it all over again. Mm -hmm. They're just, they kind of force you to notice another year's past. And that can be really hard. And I bet you and everyone listening knows someone who really struggles over the holiday season. And maybe it's you guys. Maybe you're the one who struggles. But whether you're on the holiday struggle bus or your daughter is, there are two words that are packed full of power and truth to help you through it. The first word is Emmanuel, which may sound familiar to you if you've sung Christmas songs before or read a couple scriptures. So, Dana, the first time we see it in the Bible is Isaiah 7, 14. Can you read that, please? I would love to. All right, then. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Yeah. And we hear it again, actually, in Matthew one twenty three, when they, they quote that same scripture in regard to the birth of Jesus. Mm. It's possibly easy for us to think of Emmanuel as just a Christmas word. Mm. There are some words and studies maybe we do just over Christmas time. We don't think about them other times of the year. But I love Emmanuel all year long, personally. And there's all kinds of ways that God is with us in scriptures. Emmanuel means God is with us. Mm-hmm. And his withness is all through scripture. So this is we're going to go through the Bible really fast. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Yeah. So in the Garden of Eden, we have perfect withness mm-hmm. with God. And then um, with the Israelites, there's in Deuteronomy 1, there's a scripture that says, you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son. Mm-hmm. Withness. Mm-hmm. Psalm 46.1 says that God is a very present help in trouble. 
And then Matthew 1, like we just talked about, the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. And then John 1, 14 talks about Jesus coming in human form. So the Word became human and made His home among us. Mm -hmm. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. And then the witness of God shows up again in John 14, because of the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. (laughs) verses 15 through 17. If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another advocate who will never leave you, Mm witness. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Mm -hmm. And then in Revelation 21, Eden restored. Mm -hmm. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. Mm, That gives me chills. Right? I love it. (laughs) The witness of God is all through the whole Bible. And that last one, that eternity piece, is where I want to talk about our next word. So our first word was Emmanuel. God is with us. The next word is Maranatha. Maranatha means, oh, Lord, come, or our Lord will come. So in 1 Corinthians 16, 22 is where we see this word. If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed, and our Lord come. The word is Maranatha. Now, I know not everyone grew up like me, but my dad always, always pointed us to the hope of heaven. We talked about heaven. He answered questions about it. He preached about it. It was a normal conversation for us to talk about Jesus coming back. And from what I can see, maybe, you know, we've gotten away from teaching our kids about heaven as something more than where we go when we die. Like heaven is the ultimate witness of God. Mm. It's the very reason we can go through hard times because we know our problems on earth are light and momentary compared to eternity. This is not our home. So when our girls are struggling over the holidays, we can teach them this two-word prayer, Emmanuel, Maranatha. Mm. Essentially, we're teaching them to say, God, thank you that you are with me during this hard time. And I look forward to the day that Jesus comes back and I'm living with you forever. Wow. Mm. I love that. That's awesome. Very seldom do our hard things just go away when we pray. But knowing that one day all of our troubles will be gone forever gives us strength to keep going in the midst of these hard times. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Emmanuel, Maranatha, God is with us. Oh, Lord, come. Mm, What a great prayer. Thank you, Janet Mylan. So if we start feeling like whining and saying, are we there yet? As in, can this hard thing be over? Can I be done with the struggles I'm facing right now? I don't like this illness. Or I'd rather be at peace in this difficult relationship. Are we there yet? This journey feels like it's too long and no fun. When we feel those things, we can pray that wonderful prayer, Emmanuel, God with us, Maranatha, O Lord, come. You know, speaking of the witness of God, that's something Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth has meditated on a lot, related to the familiar song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The first stanza is the one that is most familiar to us, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. The picture here is of the children of Israel in captivity in Babylon. They were in mourning. They were lonely. They were in exile. They were away from their homeland. They were living somewhere they didn't really belong. 
They were in a culture that was foreign to their faith and a culture that didn't know and honor Jehovah as they had been trained to do. And it was a season where life was just hard. And the words of this stanza express the longing of the Jewish people to be delivered. You see, the Messiah was the one that God had promised for centuries, the one who would come and deliver His people, the one who would ransom them from their captivity. And so the song expresses a longing, come Emmanuel and do it. Now the chorus is a statement of faith and assurance and praise that in fact Messiah will come. Rejoice! Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. It's a promise. Now, Emmanuel is a title for Messiah that is first found in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, where we read in verse 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, as many of you know, is the Hebrew word that means God is with us. God with us. This was a promise that was given to Ahaz, who was a king of Judah. And he was being threatened by an alliance of two northern armies coming from Syria and Israel. And he was terrified. God sent to Ahaz the prophet Isaiah with a promise from God. It's a promise that the enemies of God would be defeated, that Ahaz had nothing to fear, that he should not be terrified. And God gave Ahaz a sign that his promise would be fulfilled. The sign was that a woman who had never had a child would become pregnant, would give birth to a child, and before that child was old enough to know right and wrong, when the child was still a toddler, within two or three years, the threat of the opposing armies would disappear. The armies would go away. The deliverance would come. And the sign was that God would send this child named Emmanuel, whose name means God is with us. Now, that was the immediate fulfillment, but there was a longer-term promise here that was not fulfilled until 700 years later, when an angel made an appearance to a young, unmarried virgin in Nazareth and told her that she was to have a child. And we read in Matthew's account, verse 22 of chapter 1, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So here was a second and more important fulfillment to God's promise that God would be with us and that we could be free from terror, from the enemy, because God was coming to earth. And in answer to that promise, we know that God did come. He came to this earth. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And I want us to be reminded this Christmas that the coming of God to earth in the form of Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world. Not just for those Jews who were mourning in lonely exile, but for us as the children of God in this church age as well. God's promise was not just one to deliver His people from physical captivity, but more importantly, it was a promise to deliver His people from spiritual captivity from their sin. So until the Son of God appeared, the song says, well, until the Son of God appeared, until Jesus came, we were in captivity. We were enslaved to sin. We were enslaved to Satan. We were in exile, just as those Jews were in exile. We were alienated, lonely, separated from God, separated from others, barriers and walls in our relationships because we didn't have God. We had reason to mourn, even as those Jews did. Our plight was miserable and hopeless. As we read in Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were separated from Christ. We were alienated and strangers to the covenants of promise. We had no hope, and we were without God in the world. What a way to live. And just a reminder that that is the way that most of the world lives yet today. Mourning in lonely exile in captivity to Satan and sin, until the Son of God appears. The song says, what does the coming of Emmanuel mean to us? Well, it means the end of captivity. It means that we've been ransomed, that we've been redeemed. It means the end of exile. 
We're no longer alienated, no longer separated from God and from one another. Ephesians 2 tells us you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You know what that says to me? We're back home. No longer in a foreign land, but back home with God. It's the end of aloneness when Emmanuel comes. It means that God is with us. And I don't know about you, but my heart says, if God is with me, what else and who else do I really have to have? If God is with me. And Jesus said to his disciples as he left this earth and returned to heaven, he said, I am with you always, Emmanuel, even to the end of the age. The coming of Emmanuel means we can rejoice. Not just because Emmanuel is coming, but because Emmanuel has come. And we no longer mourn as those who have no hope. Amen. It's such a comfort to remember that in Jesus, our Emmanuel, and through His Spirit, God is truly with us. That's Nancy Damas Walgamuth explaining some of the lines in the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You're listening to Revive Our Hearts Weekend. I'm Dana Gresh. Now, earlier in this episode, Janet Milan encouraged us to pray, Emmanuel Maranatha, meaning God is with us, come Lord Jesus. Well, when Aaron Davis was leading a study on the life of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, she thought about that word, Maranatha. Let's listen to Aaron in conversation with some friends. You'll hear her talking mostly with Jaquel Crow. Don't you hate it when movies end in such a way just to tee up the next movie? Oh, right. Man. Yeah, and that's you know, nice. they're just trying to get more of my dollars and yeah. they're going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're going to. We will go see it. Frustrating. I definitely will. And that's sort of how Elizabeth's <laughs> yes. story yeah. ends seemingly. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. we know the child grew and he was strong and, and he in lived the in the wilderness. Yeah. <laughs> was she in the wilderness? Why we don't know. know. Yeah. So it feels like we're just teed up for the mm-hmm. next part of mm-hmm. the story and it can be frustrating. Yeah. But. This is why the whole counsel of God is so rich. Mm. Um, why it is so good for us to know what it says in Genesis and Revelation and everywhere in between. Because in a way, we can know the end of Elizabeth's story because it's the same as the end of our story. Right. And while we would want it to be wrapped up in a tidy bow, she had a longing. The Lord met the longing. Mm-hmm. She saw the Messiah. We don't get that, but we do know she's going to see the Messiah. Um, So every day of Elizabeth's life, he was moving her towards the day when the Messiah Mm. would come. Um, She didn't know that. She had no way of knowing. You know, when we open the pages of the New Testament, we've just ended a 400-year period Mm. of God's people waiting. That's a long time. Silence. And there's no way for Elizabeth to know that she's about to come Mm -hmm. to the exclamation point at the end of that and the next chapter. And as she faced that disappointment of infertility, God was really busy preparing the way for Jesus to come. And so that is the same thing that he's doing in all of our disappointments. So spoiler alert, let's read the end of Elizabeth's story. It is in Revelation 22, 12. Do you have it for us? I do. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. He's coming. Mm. He's coming for each of us. There's that word that we find only once in scripture, Maranatha, Mm. which is come quickly, Lord Jesus. And really all of Elizabeth and Zechariah's life was that word, Maranatha. They knew a Messiah was coming. They were from faithful Levitical families that were waiting for the Savior. And yes, there was this unfulfilled longing, but there was this he's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's yeah. coming. And he, they got to see him come for the first time as Emmanuel Christ with us. But they will be a part of the moment when you and I and Elizabeth and Mary all get to see him come for us again. He, the Bible says he's coming quickly. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't feel quick sometimes, <laughs> There will right? be more of that time. girl squeeling. There will yeah. be. Yeah. Oh, he's there coming. Will be a big yeah. I know that I don't get to tell the Lord what to do ever, but Every day I'm like, today would be a good day. Now, <laughs> sound, now seems today, good. There's still yeah. time today for you to come. Mm-hmm. And so we um, share with Elizabeth in that watchfulness, mm-hmm. in hoping for a Savior and waiting for Him. Yeah. And really the end of her story and the end of her disappointment isn't the baby. Right. It's the redemption that 
came, when Jesus came the first time and when he comes for us. So what's cool about Elizabeth's story is that we share the happy ending with her. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't get to see the happy ending necessarily completed, but we do know that Jesus is coming for each of us. Mm-hmm. And that gives me such great hope mm-hmm. in the face of disappointment. It right? does. And it really connects us to Elizabeth and these women and these people of the Bible as real people. We are going to experience that with Elizabeth. The ending is the same. Exactly. And, you know, all of, all of God's family, like we will be united together, all of our longings and disappointments Mm. and unmet desires will be fulfilled in Jesus is coming back and we're going to see him and know him and be with him together. And there will be this new home for us. Yeah. And this new home for us where there's no crying, there's no pain. We could insert into there, there's no disappointment because if we're not crying and we're not worried, then we're we're not disappointed. There's no son because Christ himself is our light. And Elizabeth will be there with us. And Elizabeth's story bleeds into Mary's. We know that they're relatives from the text. We know that when Mary finds out she's pregnant, it's Elizabeth's home that she goes to Mm. kind of hide herself in. And it seems like, okay, the ending of both of their stories is these miraculous baby boys. Um, But really the ending of their stories is being with Jesus for millions and millions and millions and millions of years. They didn't know that. You know, they didn't even have what we have, the book of Revelation. They didn't even have the text that tells the end of the story. They just had this hope that Jesus was going to keep his promises. So I think that is, that's the final chapter of your disappointment. It's the final chapter of my disappointment is that there's going to be redemption. That's all really high level thinking. Mm. Practically. Right. Tell me in your own lives, when you face disappointment, how do you hold on to that happy ending that's coming? Hmm. I think we talk about gratitude so much in something like this and count your blessings and be grateful. But I think in the Old Testament, there were so many times when they set up altars of remembrance, yep. mm-hmm. when he gave them the 10 commandments and when he cleared up the Jordan River and they set up these altars of remembrance and it's so that they could remind themselves in a physical, tangible way, mm-hmm. God was faithful. Yep. And they could go back to that. And so I think that's really what we are trying to get at when we encourage each other Mm -hmm. um, in gratitude is go back to your altars of remembrance. Where has God been faithful? Mm -hmm. How have you seen him come through before? Remember that now Yep. in the day-to-day. Yep. And I have all these little sayings I have to say to myself. Uh, I'm not trying to be tweetable or shareable. I just... (laughs) I need them for myself. Yeah, yeah. And one of them is I tell myself often, it won't be long now. Mm. Even, you know, in the span of eternity, yeah. it won't be long now. Exactly. The Bible says it's in a little while. Yeah. And in the middle of pain and heartbreak and disappointment, it doesn't feel like it's in a little while. It feels like this is going oh, yeah. on forever. Right. But it won't be long now. Yeah. Yeah. He's coming for me. It won't mm-hmm. be long now. Um, and I remind myself of that really often. And mm-hmm. and I frequently tell myself, he's done it before. He'll do it again. Yeah. He's done it before. He'll do it again. He's rescued me. That's those altars of remembrance. Yes. And I put that everywhere. If you were to be in my home, you would see words everywhere. And part mm-hmm. of that's maybe just that I identify with words stronger than some other things, but it is those altars of remembrance. Mm-hmm. I want me and my family, wherever we turn, to mm-hmm. be smacked with the truth because yeah. right? we need it. Right. Yeah. We are we have spiritual amnesia all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, we forget, oh no, this is going to be the time he <laughs> fails right. us, right. we think. Yeah. Yeah. No. This is it. And so, you know, on I... Nearly every wall of my home. And when we bought our home and remodeled our home, we ripped out all the floors and painted all the walls. We wrote Bible verses everywhere mm, before wow. we put new floor down. He's in the we, foundation. We, of the, we home. put them everywhere before we painted the walls. We put them behind the cabinets before we installed the cabinets mm-hmm. because it was like, I love that. we got to know that underneath all this stuff yeah. um, is the truth that's going to shore us up. And I think. That woman that's listening, she needs to put it wherever Mm -hmm. she can put it. Sometimes I get a Sharpie and I just scrawl it on my arm because I need it that close to me. That this is, there's there's a different ending to this story Mm -hmm. than what I can see Mm -hmm. right now. Mm, Such good reminders from Aaron Davis and some friends on the Women of the Bible podcast from the season on the life of Elizabeth. I hope your Christmas is filled with wonder and the right kind of excitement. And in those moments when you're sick of the journey God has you on, don't forget that simple two-word prayer that's full of meaning. 
Emmanuel Maranatha. I'm Dana Gresh. Thanks for listening to Revive Our Hearts Weekend and Merry Christmas. Revive Our Hearts Weekend, calling you to freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.